what often happens in, in this path is when you least expect it in the last possible environment is when you can really just get tapped right on the head, and that's what happened. In detail, one man's account of awakening to true identity. I was sitting by the pool, wasn't really thinking anything, because I felt like a veil had dropped right in front of my face. The entire world shot up. We got above what you could call ego consciousness, and I experienced directly the peace that passeth all understanding. For Tyler Matthew. This was his Satori experience, seeing into one's very essence. And it was totally imperturbable. There was no sense of anything wrong. And you can realize that you are this I am that I am. That's, that is what you actually are. And that you are not a person in a body walking around. That this I that you are is eternal. It exists outside of time and space. It's there in deep sleep. It's there right now. It's there in the dream state. It is your true self, and it is always there. It is only distorted because there is an identification with all these thoughts and feelings, and, and in so doing, it creates the perception and the illusion of the psychological self that isn't actually real and never was and never will be. What makes this story so different from our 450 other Soul Journeys interviews? Tyler came through this awakening not once, but twice. I mean, it's what everybody's looking for. I mean, it, it is. It's, it's, what, it's your true self, undistorted by thoughts, undistorted by feelings or false identifications. It's just you. But after that first awakening, everything changed. The door got blown open. But the next part of the process is this stuff wants to come up, and it's got to be released. This stuff, called vasanas by one of Tyler's most prominent teachers, Ramana Maharshi, has to go. Gains made in awakening without rooting out all vasanas, all tendencies, according to Ramana, cannot remain. And I, I guess I'll use that as a launching point to talk a little bit about Ramana's influence for a second here. Um, you know, the first time I picked up his book was before I had had that big awakening at 30, and I just knew... I mean, I just knew, like, this guy is on it. He is the real deal, you know, if not the, the greatest sage that ever was. I just knew. Soon, after his first awakening with Ramana's teachings and with the expert guidance from his friend Mike, Tyler somehow made it through seven-plus years of sheer suffering, the dark night. And then again, with Ramana's help and Mike's, a second deep awakening. Even after coming out of the dark night of the soul, those really, really difficult years. I was much, much calmer. Life was much better. But I wasn't really experiencing what you'd call joy. And what I found was when I had that second awakening, listening to the Rubu Gita, when you realize that you are the screen of consciousness itself, and every single thing is the self, there is joy right there. Welcome to Soul Journeys, to a conversation from start to finish filled with personal revelations about the achievement of self-awareness. This interview was recorded on October 8, 2022 in Asheville, North Carolina and Coronado, California. Tyler, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here with us on Soul Journeys today. Welcome to this program. I've been wanting to interview you for a long time now, and finally the moment has arrived. First, I want to tell you how, how important your pointings, let's call them that, have been to me and countless hundreds, if not thousands of others around the country. Do you consider yourself to be a spiritual teacher? I do not. But I'll tell you what, we have had some fun, and I've loved uh, getting your emails and... Um, you know, it's a very natural thing, and and when I point for someone, it's it's kind of like just how you might do anything. You just respond to the question as naturally as you can, and, and the self does the rest, and I don't consider myself a teacher because I don't really consider myself anything, um, and I'm here today because you said you wanted to do an interview, and I said, all right, and there we go. Maybe I should also ask you at this time, since it seems to be tied into your comment there, would that be something you would be comfortable with if I uh, 
told people I could pass along their comments to you. Yeah, absolutely. No, look, I I love talking about this the passion of my life. Um, it's it came for me. <laughs> I didn't expect it, uh, but I would I would never hold myself out as a teacher. I would never want to do that. But I'm happy to point, and I love to point, and I I really have enjoyed talking with you. It, it's anybody who's naturally really curious and sincere they're a friend of mine about <laughs> this you know and that's it and and most people i run into are and i've met some amazing people and it's it's been great i appreciate being on i, I hope this doesn't make me famous or anything I, you seem to have a lot of subscribers so we'll just go with it but uh yeah let, let's do it i've had a dickens of a time finding anything about you but i did find one thing digging through some of the archives and it's something that just astounded me when I read it, and it's going to launch us into your story right now. And that is at the age of 30, a young man on your birthday, poolside in Las Vegas, all of that conjures up a wonderful image. <laughs> you had, and this is the serious part, a spontaneous and unexpected Satori. A satori is a $25 word we don't use very often on soldiers. This may be. It's the process of awakening that you were exposed to, awakening to the inner experience of enlightenment. Those are heavy duty words, but I know they're true in your case because I've studied your situation now for going on four years. It is a deep experience of seeing into one's true nature. How about we use this as the launching pad to hear your story both before your 30th birthday and up to now and take your time, go into as much detail as you want. And the floor is yours. And I'll All have right. some questions along the way. Okay, yeah, hop in any anytime you want me to clarify something. Um, where to start? Uh, I guess I'll go back to my teenage years. Uh, I, live, I grew up in a very lovely home, very lovely parents and, and sister, and I felt very supported. Um, I had a strange feeling that something wasn't right, and, and not in a, in a bad sense, but just like this was almost too good to be true. Like it just felt weird. I would look around and I thought, this something just feels off about this reality. I, I don't know what it is but it sure feels strange. And I didn't have any, uh, any involvement with any spiritual teachings at that time, no spiritual teachers. I didn't read anything. But I started going around and I would talk to people and I'd say, you know, the way you're talking that you're presupposing you're a separate I. <laughs> Where are you getting that? Like, why do you think that's what you are? And I have no idea why I did that. But I, for a couple of years, I just had this weird sense of there's something weird about this individual I. Like, I'm not sure that's what we are. And I just, it just came out of nowhere in my teenage years. You could call it a precursor. God knows it ended up to become the passion of my life to figure out what that was all about, but it, it just showed up. And after that, I became, I went to college and I, I, I got involved in Eastern philosophy and I really took to it and tried to meditate a bunch of times. Um, it never really stuck, but I kept coming back to it. And, and then um, I got, ended up to get a really coveted job um, in the legal profession. And I won't go into the specifics about it, but I went to law school and I got this really prestigious legal job and I went to work one day. I'd been there a couple of years and I looked around and I thought, well, I got this really great job. I got plenty of money. I have my health. I have a lot of friends. And I also, you know, was able to, to, to date women that I wanted to mostly, not, not everyone. But um, where's this happiness thing? You know, you know, where is this joy that life promised me? You know, I did what, what society said to do. I went out and did it and, and here I am and I'm not seeing it. And you know what? I'm not seeing it really in anyone else either. And that really kicked off kind of an existential crisis. 
um, pretty big time. And it, that coupled with a, what I would call a bad uh, breakup with a girl, I really started to circle down the drain. And it got bad real quick. And I started to have just these massive panic attacks. And I also started to feel this crazy pressure in the center of my chest. Um, it was so bad, I actually went to a cardiologist. I had no idea what was going on, but I felt this crazy pressure right here. I'm having these panic attacks and it was bad. I can literally remember crawling under my desk at work, just trying to write out these panic attacks and just being like, what is going on here? And uh, eventually I, I, I stabilized a little bit, but I found myself in Barnes and Noble one night wandering around and I picked up a book by Lester Levinson. And he, he was a man who, who developed what they called the Sedona method, uh, was a mystic, was a really amazing teacher. I think a lot of his teachings has been distorted by some of the people that came after him, but he, he was an amazing teacher. And I read it and I just thought, yeah, I, I got to go another way with this thing. And so I really, really, I was ripe. I was desperate. And I jumped in full head into the perennial wisdom, you could call it. I got the call, you could say. And I was on board. I had become a seeker. Um, and I took to like a duck on water. I would, I would, all of a sudden meditation became easy and wonderful. And I did it all day. I mean, I, I read books all day, anything. I couldn't get enough of it. Um, and this went on for three or four years or so. And then one day I would met my family. They were on the West Coast, I was on the East Coast. We, I met them in Las Vegas. Uh, it was kind of a middle point and they enjoyed it. And what often happens in, in this path is when you least expect it, in the last possible environment, is when you can really just get tapped right on the head. And that's what happened. I, I opened up a book. I was sitting by the pool. Wasn't really thinking anything. Certainly wasn't expecting anything. And I read some words attributed to the Buddha. And it was the most odd, oddest thing because I felt like a veil had dropped right in front of my face, an invisible veil. And I was totally stunned. And then all I can say is I shot up out of my body, not out of my body, with my body, the entire world shot up. We got above what you could call ego consciousness. And I experienced directly the peace that passeth all understanding. Mm. And it was totally imperturbable. The word I like to use is it was total satiation. I was totally satiated. There was no sense of anything wrong, could be wrong, or ever was wrong. And I just was up there and uh, I had no idea what was going on. I mean, I had no words to describe this, but I, I passed through that, uh, that a whole weekend like that. And it was, I mean, it's what everybody's looking for. I mean, it, it is, it's, it's, what, it's your true self undistorted by thoughts, undistorted by feelings or false identifications. It's just you. Before we move on, you just said you have no words to describe this while you used quite a few words to describe this right now. And often people just sort of pass over that. And so do people who interview others who had these experiences. It's at least worth a try to ask you if you could bring up a few more words that might describe for those for the benefit of those of us who have not had that, what it was like. Yeah, well, at the time, I certainly had zero words. Now I have a couple. <laughs> um, it's a feeling of, have you ever floated in water? Yes. Or uh, a sense of just being weightless? You, you're, um, everything is so light. And everything is, is smooth and there's no, um, there's nothing bombarding you, hitting you as like problematic or confusing. Um, you're just resting in peace, with peace, as peace. 
And in fact, there's so there's no thoughts, there's no self-referential thinking. So you're not even analyzing the experience. You're not being like, oh, look at me now. Like this, it even that is offline. There's just peace. And I don't really know how to describe it other than that is all I can say is there is not a need in the slightest to add anything or get anything. It was self-contained. All my needs were met. There was no desire. I mean, that's like maybe maybe that's just the best way to describe it. There was just no desire. And the body continued on. It walked around, it talked. Uh, it wasn't separate from the piece. Mm -hmm. It was part of it. Um, but there were just was a sense that nothing needed to be added or taken away. Any significance that this happened on your 30th birthday in Las Vegas? Well, uh, you know, I mean, I had uh, kind of like I said, I, this isn't this way as a rule, but I think oftentimes when you kind of least expect it, you kind of let your guard down. I was actually just sitting there reading. I, I wasn't even doing intense meditation or anything. I, I'd come there to visit my parents and and just boom. And, and that's a good lesson for anyone listening to this. You know, you, you don't know when an awakening can happen. I mean, it can literally happen at any moment. It might be after 30 years of struggling and striving or it might be just the first time you open a book you know our, our infinite self there's no rules with it. it it there's no set pattern with it and you just never know uh, and that and i experienced it that day why it was on my 30th birthday uh that was just my the life path um and that's just the way it was going to be and that's the way it, it happened so Let's go and continue with the story then. When I interrupt you, I, I want to get back on track as quickly as possible then. Yeah, yeah, because we got to get to the good part or, or uh, the, you know, the, however many people are listening to this, they're like, whoa, <laughs> okay, that's scary. Um, I had about six months of bliss after that. And in fact, I would, I would come around people and they would be like, there is, you know, there's just something different. You know, you're like glowing or something. I said, yeah. I am. You should really start meditating. <laughs> I probably pissed so many people off because I, at the time, I thought it was all it had been linked to meditation a lot, and, and that isn't actually untrue. But it's not exactly true either. Meditation is not necessarily a cause for awakening. It can be a contributing factor, I'd like to say. But anyway, about six months, I walked around and I was just. Uh, I was just in a euphoric state and life felt easy. And, and uh, I, I had floated back down to some relative thinking and, and some referential thoughts and things, but life was wonderful. Uh, and then something happened that I could have never imagined. And um, had I known it, I was, it was gonna happen, I would have probably, and this is an honest statement, I'm gonna be honest with your viewers here, you know, the, the five or six of them still listening, that this, if I had known what was going to happen, I probably wouldn't have never picked up a, a book and read anything. Because what happened was I just started to be put through one life debacle after the next. And I mean, some really scary things started arising things related to illnesses that were mysterious um, really scary work situations one time i thought through no fault of my own i might be like have to go to jail because i had been in business with like a very corrupt person um i had a massive amount of relationship debacles i, I became estranged from my family for a time I mean, it felt like just one crazy episode after the next. And I had no idea why. I mean, just for the longest time, I, I really was, I just could not understand why I was being put through the ringer. And I do now, but at the time I didn't. Um, and what was happening was these life events were, um, basically bringing up suppressed energies, vasanas, uh, parts of what you could call egoic consciousness. They were bringing them up and they were knocking them out. So I had to 
go through these experiences to kind of chip away at what was left of this kind of personal will, you know, the self partiality, you could say. Um, because even though I, I realized what I was on my 30th birthday, I came back down and that happens for a lot of people. It didn't all get wiped away at that moment. You know, you, you drift back down and, and then there's still this stuff in you that needs to be emptied out. And the thing that needs to be emptied out, I, I call it personal will. You could call it the vasanas. You could call it habits and tendencies. You could even call it karma. Whatever you want to call it, there's just stuff inside you. There's thought patterns, there's conditionings, there's programmings that come to the surface. And oftentimes when they come to the surface, they're, they're reflected back to you in life. And that's why a lot of seekers say, you know, I've been dealt with a lot of suffering on the path because that, that is what's kind of happening. They're, they're moving along. They're making progress in a sense but life seems to be getting harder. And I've had a lot of email, people email me about this and I said, yeah, it's, I've been there, I understand. It's very difficult, but it's serving a purpose and it's incredibly effective. But what was the point of this? Because Tyler, as I understand it, from your talking right now, all of this suffering, let's just use that word, occurred after your awakening. I was under the wrong uh, impression that it happened prior to your awakening, which would have made sense to me. Why is it necessary? Why would it have been necessary after? Because this is this is an important point, and I don't want anyone to to clamp down on this. And, and and what I'm about to say is a categorical rule. However, I think it goes a lot like this for a lot of folks: is that you can have a big awakening. But just because you had that first awakening and you see your true nature, that doesn't mean that it has knocked out all of your stuff and that you have gone totally beyond egoic consciousness or what you might call the personal will or self partiality. You have taken a huge step. But what happened to me, and I've, I've talked to a number of other people about this, is you really opened the door, got blown open. So now there's a big opening. But the next part of the process is this stuff wants to come up. It's, it's in there. It's in your system. It's a part of what you could call subject object consciousness. And it's got to be released because what you'll eventually see is, and this is, this is really true, what you are is not uh, special or out of the ordinary. It's constant. It's there now. It's fully, fully realized right here and now. It's just there's all this stuff that's getting in the way and blocking it. And it's the thoughts. It's the identifications with thoughts. It's the suppressed feelings. It's, it's the energy of the personal will. And that stuff has got to go for you to just consciously be yourself. And that is what everyone is looking for, to just consciously be yourself. <laughs> because it's, it's, it's blissful, it's peace, it's, it's ease, but it's not special and it's not out of the ordinary and it's not off in some other realm. It's just you without all your stuff. And it's, it's really that simple. I always so, thought of it as being this fog, very thick fog brought sure. on by all the vasanas, the, you know, the tendencies in my life of which like everybody else, there are countless and it's just so almost impossible to get through to the other side to find this true self. But you made it somehow. Well, you're making it too. You know, we'll talk about it a little later because there was a, another, uh, a better, not, not better. There was another realization later on, but you're, you're too. When you're just resting as I and just your normal self and you're not caught up in your thinking and your feelings, and, and you're not identifying with your thoughts and your feelings you're just being your natural self too what's happening though is that a long habit and something inherent in this realm of ego consciousness we just get only brief moments of that you know like when you lose yourself in an activity and you're not thinking and you're not like "Ooh, what should i do that's just you being your natural self. that is it that's you being your natural self. But what happens is in, in our 
this human experience we're having is we don't get that very long. The thoughts come back, we start identifying with them and we get all caught up and we get uh, turned around. And like you just said, there's a, there's a fog and, it, and it's weighty. That's the thing, it, it feels like it's weighing us down. Whereas our natural self is light and free and it, it's ever present. And it's just you without your stuff. You make it sound too simple. And yet so many people, simple or difficult, the vast majority of us, overwhelming majority of us, fail to cut through that fog. Well, and that's what I want to say, because the, the suffering that I went through, you know, the dark night of the soul, it lasted seven, eight, maybe even nine years. I mean, debacle after debacle after debacle. I mean, this was not a quick thing. I was just talking to my wife last night and we were kind of reminiscing about some of the episodes, which is a miracle in of itself that someone would even stick with someone going through this. I mean, that's a real, you want to talk about grace, but, and we were just like, oh my God, yeah, that was, that was horrible. When that, I mean, it was a lot. And that's the thing I do like to emphasize to people. I'm a realist about this. The truth is simple. It's the simplest thing there ever could be. But the amount of stuff that, that we're carrying, this karmic load, this, these vastness, it's a lot. I mean, it, it is not, well, it wasn't for me and it hasn't been some, you know, just have an awakening at 30 and then, well, we're all done here. I mean, <laughs> I wish it was, but that's not how it was at all. And it's, it's a long process of a lot of stuff having to come out. And the way that happened for me was suffering in life as well as, and this is what I also want to emphasize, a lot of self-inquiry. I mean, all day self-inquiry, really. You know, looking at the thoughts, looking at the feelings. Uh, we'll get into some Ramana Maharshi stuff here. But it was a it was a combined effort of um, self inquiry and life, you know, getting me to a place where all of a sudden I I wasn't really I wasn't being bantered around in the same way by these vasanas. I'd like to add one thing to that. About the same time, you know, more or less to the month that I first met you or heard about you or saw the video of you, and then joined a group on Thursdays that you were participating in. About that same time is when we first learned, my wife and I, about the teachings of Ramana Maharshi. Always in our adult life, we knew about it, just didn't pay any attention to it. And it just knocked me over. And it really in, impressed upon me the absolute need, uh, not in a punitive way, but in a way to help you clear through the fog of self-inquiry. Self-inquiry is where all of a sudden I felt somebody, a teacher, although he's been dead since 1950, Ramana Maharshi was asking something of me. Do this. Look inside. No, don't just peer inside. Find out what's behind these tendencies, what's behind these thoughts that are the most troubling. And so being on this path for 30 or 40 or more years, it didn't really gel until just recently, which is quite amazing all by itself. Yeah. And I, I will say, and I'm going to talk hopefully a lot about Ramana. He, he's very dear to me. Um, this is so confusing and disorientating at times. You really do, the vast majority of people, and myself certainly included, probably even more than most people, you, you do need a guide. You, you probably need a few. And, and, and I had Ramana, and I also had this great, I was given the grace of a very uh, wise, um, very powerful person. I'm only gonna call him Mike. He, he likes to stay hidden and I totally understand why. <laughs> um, but he did a ton of pointing for me for many years and him along with Ramana really helped while I'm getting bombarded by life and also trying to do this self-inquiry to get uh, to get clear and you know to get right with this at least to the point of where i'm not um you know a mess and, and filled with anxiety and and confusion on, on a daily basis so 
most people need a guide. They probably need a few. It's really helpful. And it's just, I mean, I, for people that don't have that and they, they get clear all on their own there, that's some special souls or something, because that's, uh, certainly wasn't the case for me. I really needed that, uh, quite a bit actually. So you left out one thing in my humble opinion, because you once told me about this, Mike, and I looked him up and I found out that he was amazingly somehow available. And I went back and forth with him several times, maybe five or six only. His information, his support, his teachings, if you wanted to call them that, were spot on. I really benefited from them. But each and every one of them came with a certain bite. <laughs> I think uh, you know what I'm talking about. How did you manage to withstand those frequent exercises of toughness while you were learning from him as a teacher? <laughs> well, uh, I have an answer to that. It's because I didn't care. And I needed the truth. And I needed to get right with this. And I knew he was clear and strong and so he tried to get rid of me many times <laughs> and I just kept coming back and and he told me once he said you know you just wouldn't go away and I said no I, I wasn't I mean I, I you know earnestness is something that comes or it doesn't and it, it just showed up for me and it was so powerful that I was like I just I got to do what I got to do here and I knew he had the good so I stuck with him, but, and now we're um, very close, you know, friends and uh, I still love him to pieces and, and Ramana too. It, 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 without a guide, it's just really hard. It, when these vasanas are coming up and you're being bantered all over the place and, or even if you just have a great awakening, I mean, how much that it jolts you and, and you don't fit in life in the same way. You just, other people that have, have experience with it it's just really important yeah so let's uh, put a, another underscore under that idea of needing a teacher and i want to point out because the channel upon which on youtube i i post these uh interviews is called soul journey which is an outgrowth of my wife and i having a huge interest for the last quarter century in our teacher sai baba his message is identical to ramana's and in many respects although i didn't recognize it at the time he his influence in my life was nudging me towards the self-inquiry which is really demanded by Ramana Maharshi which you're going to talk about but that teacher that doesn't mean you have to have only one teacher but the combination for me and then finding out about you is what's kept me nose to the stone yeah it's just uh it, you know it's really important um I there's a few rare souls that don't need it but most do and and I, I guess I'll use that as a launching point to talk a little bit about Ramana's influence for a second here. Um, you know, the first time I picked up his book was before I had had that big awakening at 30. And I just knew, I mean, I just knew like this guy is on it. I mean, this is, this guy is, he is the real deal. You know, if not the, the greatest sage that ever was, I just knew. And I, what I loved and still to this day love, and I appreciate more now than I did way back then is his message was so simple. In fact, it's so simple that people struggle with it, but it's like, if you're going to do self-inquiry, which, you know, was his third step down, first is silence, just being in his presence. That was his real teaching. Second is you're already enlightened, which is true. And we can talk about that realization that, that came later for me too. But the third is do self-inquiry, place attention on the sense of I, dwell on the sense of I. It's not hard. It's the easiest thing you ever had to do. It's always there. It doesn't go anywhere. And if you do that long enough, you start to sever the identifications with thoughts. You sever the identification with feelings, with perceptions, with sensations. And you begin to isolate this I. And in so doing, you can cut through a lot of stuff a lot of this vastness and things will start to fall away and you can realize that you are this i am that i am that's that is what you actually are 
and that you are not a person in a body walking around in a world, that this I that you are is eternal. It exists outside of time and space. It's there in deep sleep. It's there right now. It's there in the dream state. It is your true self and it is always there. And it is only distorted because there is an identification with all these thoughts and feelings and sensations. And in so doing, it creates the perception or the illusion of this little separate self, this little psychological self that isn't actually real and never was, and never will be. Well, and Rama's well, teaching is very, very simple. Yeah. And that's what I love so much about it. Talk for one minute, if you will, about Rama's core teachings also. I mean, you have many core teachings that uh, the world isn't real, that nor is your thought, nor is your mind, nor is your identity. There is no Ted. There is no Tyler. Those are huge hills for people to climb over who are new to this program. Yeah, they and are. Do, and, do you, and do you believe in that? Well, I guess we can jump forward to um, uh, the bigger realization I had. Um, so life started to get a little easier again after this dark night of the soul forever. <laughs> um, I started taking to the self-inquiry more and more and more. And what I started to feel like was, okay, I'm, I'm on to the, I can abide as the unborn. I can abide as the I, I can abide as the self. I started to realize what it meant to be still. It's like, okay, I'm not chasing an experience anymore. I'm not looking for something to happen. I'm not trying to purge myself of anything anymore. I'm not trying to fix or heal anything. I'm abiding as the I, I'm dwelling in the I, I'm dwelling in the unborn, which is another word I've, I've talked about with some people. I can just be that. and. I got to that place and I was like, okay, I can be still. Life was easier. It wasn't um, rip roaring amazing or anything, but I was like, I can do this. Like this is, this is, I know this is what Ramana means. This is what Mike means. This is what it means to be still. And I, I lived like that for a couple of years, just being still, uh, wasn't chasing awakenings anymore wasn't looking for even really enlightenment, just was resting as I am. I went up to see Mike for a visit and I'm on the plane and I close my eyes and I see a vision of, of Rama right in front of me. And he's 30 years old. I'd never seen this picture. I mean, if you've ever had a vision, it's more, it's, it's way more ultra real than a, any kind of imagination thing. It's like a vision. And I saw him and I, it felt like he said, I'm going to be with you this weekend. That, that's it. And I was like, sounds good to me. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but okay. Get off the plane. Um, and I'm with Mike. And for some weird reason, all weekend, Mike is using Advaita Vedanta language, which he normally uses Zen language. So it's like, all right, this is different, but he was talking in Advaita Vedanta terms, which is Ramana's lineage. And then at one point he starts, he pulls out chapter 26 of the Ribu Gita. And that's a, that's a chapter that Ramana recommended um, to people to recite. Uh, it's a very incredibly powerful text. And so he's, Mike's reading this. I'm still just being still. You know, I'm, I'm not doing it much anymore. I'm just being still. And at some point he reads it and all I can say is it felt like a light switch flipped on and I realized exactly what that text is pointing to. And that is <laughs> what you just, <laughs> what you just touched on. I'm sorry. Um, Every single thing that you're experiencing, sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell, every single thing, that is actually your true nature. That's what it is. And there's nothing outside of it. There's nothing else going on. And it's exactly like that, that phrase, 
the world is Brahman, or how does it go? The world is illusion, there is only Brahman, Brahman and the world are, are not two, or something to that effect. And that's exactly what I realized. That's exactly what that text is pointing at. It, it's a negation of all the things we're looking at that we assume are what they appear. And you can realize that they, it is an appearance, but what it really is, is you. It, it, it really is your true nature. That's what you're looking at. That's what you're smelling. That's what you're touching. That's what you're tasting. There is only the self. That's what it is. And it's showing up right now as a computer screen with this gentle, nice man in front of it with white hair talking to me. But that is the self. That's what it actually is. And it has nothing to do with denying anything, pushing the world away, or trying to vanquish the world. It's the exact opposite. It's coming into total uh, intimacy with the world. It's becoming the world consciously. Absolutely. I wasn't expecting anything again. Mike happened to be reading it out loud and, and that it, it was like a light switch flipped on and, and it is the truth. I mean, it, it's, but what I use, what I missed, we talked about on that Thursday group was if you read that text, what it's doing is it's trying to point out to you the thoughts that you're still identifying with. So from the highest point, not the highest point, from, from the status of what you really are, there is no awakening. There is no enlightenment, no liberation, no transmission. There is only you. That's it. And you can show up identifying as a human being walking around in an external world, or you can show up having an amazing awakening experience, or you can show up as being fully aware of the truth, or you can show up as something in between. But at the end of the day, it's just you, the truth, source, self, the Dharmakaya. That's what it actually is. A brief moment about that from our past, maybe six months ago on the Thursday group, uh, the subject came up and you talked to me in humor as well as in seriousness. Ted, why are you complaining? I mean, after all, you're the author of the script. You're the one writing this unfolding of our discussion here today, which led me to say in return, well, then answer this, smart guy. Uh, are you an object? Are you a figment of my dream of inventing you as I write this scenario? Or am I a figment of your dream writing this story? Yeah, it, it, I, I like to have fun with it a little bit, but I, I do want to say, because you brought it up, um, I'm not uh, a huge fan of the neo Advaita crowd. And by that, I mean, and it's not anybody's fault, okay? This is not a criticism um, at all. But a lot of folks come into contact with these non-dual teachings. And, and what they do is, they, they're meeting it on an intellectual level and they turn it into a point of view and a philosophy and they get caught up in, you know, that's not real or I'm not really here. Or, this is a dream. And that's fine. That's where they're meeting it. But that isn't what, <laughs> that isn't what Romano is pointing at. I promise you. It, it's a living realization that there is only self. And it's not an intellectual philosophy or point of view. And the reason I bring this up is because I was recently watching a talk by a woman who gave a pretty compelling talk, I thought, about the danger of getting lost in neo-advaita philosophy and how it can really actually end up estranging you from life and pushing things away and, and trying to negate everything. And I thought, you know, she makes a really good point because that's not what this is about. This is not in any way about trying to push away and say, well, that's just an illusion. No, it, you actually are coming to life in a far more authentic and sincere way. Um, and I think in the Advaita world and non-duality, it, it can get really kind of, well, this is all a dream and, and, and that's fine if that's where people are meeting the teachings, but it is not something to use as an excuse in, in, in any way to remove yourself from the world. Or I've talked to you about before, you know, I don't care what you've realized. You have karmic obligations in this life as a body. You're going to do them. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, this isn't about anybody, you know, trying to use this as an excuse. In fact, if you're doing that, make no mistake, that's your vasanas operating in a way to try and, you know, keep you from the truth because the truth is simple and it is virtue itself. You know, it, it's compassion itself. It's not going to do anything that tries to um, be estranged. And that's all I can say. Thanks for making that so clear. I'm really glad this part of the conversation evolved because I've had the same feeling. In fact, you've reminded me, you sort of uh, scolded me at one time in our back and forths about this. And I, well, you were acting up, Ted. <laughs> I understood. You know, I do two 45 minute walks a day for my health. And I'm always listening to all the teachers on YouTube. And once you put it in there, one teacher, you'll get a hundred others. It, it really focused on me the need to stay with Ramana Maharshi's teachings. I mean, they don't call it the direct path for nothing. And it's time tested. And it just makes sense. Uh, and I'm in a Ramana, Ramana Maharshi group every Sunday morning. And people come in and they want to raise these other points of view. I have to remind them, this is a Ramana Maharshi group. That we're studying his teachings, <laughs> not all these overlaying teachings that might take you in a different direction. So thank you for that. Yeah, it's important because you can really get taken on a loop and this can become a real mind, uh, you know, there's a word for it, I won't say, this is a PG program, but it can get real crazy in there. And, and what the real teachings are, pointing at is one isolating the eye but two you start to see through thoughts you're identifying with and that's where the rubber meets the road what are you actually believing and looking at those thoughts and the falling away of identification with a thought is a little step towards freedom of just being your normal self but this whole path for me had nothing to do with actually believing anything else or accepting that the world is an illusion or, or, or that I don't exist. It, it, nothing to do with that on an intellectual level. In fact, all of that has to do will take you further away from just being your true self. So if you want to get on this, you just start, and that Rigo Gita is a great place because it, it's taking you through all these thoughts that you're identifying with these concepts and starting to look like, you know, is that really true? You know, what is, what is this even thing called mind? You know, everybody, it's a big thing now. Everybody's like, I got this mind and I got to get rid of it. Well, I got news for you. Mind is another concept. So now you just created this thing in thought that now you got to get rid of. I mean, that's what it's really pointing at. Look and see what are you really believing? Yeah. That's it. And, and also, and I think Ramana was right, isolating the eye, abiding as the eye starts to sever those thought connections and thought objects with feelings and sensations extremely well yeah. uh -huh. back to the story your uh last we were there you ended the flight with mike and and ramana's teachings and you had this come to jesus experience uh take it on from there i i take it you're still going through this eight or nine year period of suffering well it had actually that had started to to fall away and life had, once I learned how to be still, which means leave everything alone, including what's happening in your inner environment and just resting as I, um, I learned to be still, life was getting easier. And that's when I saw Mike and, and he read that and I realized what the Rigo Gita was pointing at. Uh, and there's probably something to that. You know, a lot of seekers, I think, myself certainly included we spend a lot of time running around doing a lot of things but it, i had become very focused you know just being still like almost all day i not every second because you know you get lost in like a writing something for work but i had figured that out and i had calmed down you know and i wasn't listening to a thousand different talks and i wasn't reading a thousand different books i was coming into focus I was being still, I was being quiet, I was on my path, I wasn't expecting really anything, but that's kind of, I think for a lot of folks, you spend a lot of years with some crazy seeking, and then over time you start to kind of dial in more naturally, and that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to pick up with a story that left off with after Mike, because I think there's a... <laughs> 
there's definitely a conception out there that, and I've heard people say this, and I, I, I just think, boy, I mean, maybe, but that's not been my experience. Just because you realize what you are, and you can actually detect what you are in every sight, touch, sound, taste, and smell, doesn't mean the unfolding of your normal human life is going to be peaches and cream at every moment. There's still life. There's a body moving around. Yes, it's it's much easier. <laughs> it's much more enjoyable, but it's not this idea that you're going to get to this place where there's never any suffering whatsoever. I've never found it. And I don't know anyone else who has either. And Mike and I used to talk about this a lot. And I, I think there's a lot out there that these days that, you know, I remember reading Ramana Maharshi complaining a couple of times that he didn't want to go back and sit in the hall. He was tired of it. Like th this idea, you're just never going to have any unpleasantness. I haven't found that, you know, I, I, there are still things that can agitate me. The only difference is, is I can see when the agitation arises, it's my true nature. That's what it actually is. Um, so it's not really a problem, mm -hmm. but I, I do want to say that because it's, uh, I really feel like there's, it's misleading and and look maybe some maybe someday it'll all just 100 percent go away but i don't think so I, I think while we're in this human paradigm you know there's in the playing of the, the the duality experience of life there's ups and downs and it's just really not um it doesn't present as something with just absolutely zero suffering whatsoever mm -hmm. and I, I i think that's that's my way with it. If somebody disagrees, I'm fine with that. And if they say that they found the peace that passeth all understanding that every single moment of every single day, then, you know, sign me up for their seminar. I guess I'll go listen to it. But it, it hasn't been my experience, although life is much more pleasant and easier and flowing and uh, in a lot of descriptors. But it, it isn't every moment I'm just like blissed out crazy joyful or anything like that it, it, ask that same question to muji who was kind enough to be a guest on on soldiers about an hour and a half conversation that focused just on that very point and uh i'm not sure if he's described correctly when people say he's sort of a neo advaitist and takes ramana's teachings and goes sometimes this way or that way with it doesn't matter to me i wanted to ask him specifically from his own awakening how much that eliminated pain and suffering in his life and he says well don't get me wrong, it's still there. It's just that it has a shorter duration for the most part and less intensity for the most part. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> Who wouldn't want that? So that's what you're saying, essentially. Yeah, that's fair. I uh, woke up a few days ago, had a headache and no idea why. And it got worse and worse. And I recognized it was my true nature so it diminished but it was still there and i wasn't like oh good i'm, I'm glad i have a headache today no look it's diminished it's not, it doesn't bother me nearly as much as it might have if i didn't know if it, it well for it definitely would have bothered me a lot more but it was still there and not something that i was joyous about so i i agree with that and i think it's important i wish more people would talk about that and be authentic but you know this is I don't know why, but however the human paradigm is set up as part of this, it's just never going to be, it, it kind of almost needs to have some push and pull um, for the movement. I, I don't know how to really describe that, but I never found a 100% end. Although I will say, there are days where the bliss and peace are really online for whatever reason. I have no idea why, but they just present themselves and it's like, whoa. Kind of like you're just floating above everything. Um, so it does come online like that, but it is, it's still the human experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I want to emphasize that. And I don't want to mislead anybody that even if you realize everything out there is the self, I mean, and you really realize it where it's not a philosophy, you're still going to have some, some up and downs in life. There's still going to be some unpleasantness. Yeah. So what do you do when you encounter others with that? Uh, I, I, you spoke of compassion, and I, and I know you personally have talked about that uh, with me, but if, if you're raised Christian, Catholic, as I was, or Jewish, or um, it doesn't matter what the religion is, your feeling is twofold, compassion, and then praying to what you believe is the God who might be helpful in 
easing that suffering for that person. But is that how you see it today? Or do you see even another person's suffering to be the old, that very tool from which they're going to gain a deeper insight into self, perhaps? I'm still confused about the right path regarding prayer for somebody who is suffering. <sighs> Well, I can only tell you what my experience is. If I see someone praying, and, and you used to ask me about this a lot, I'm 100% okay with them praying. I'm 100% of them believing in, in a God and having that God help them. And the reason why, Ted, is because those are still manifestations of self. They're okay. They're allowed. And if that, if that person feels that's what's right and that helps them, then absolutely it's okay. And it, it, is the, it is the self anyway. So it's, a, it's, it's cool, you know? Like the um, metaphor I use for this is everything's music, but rock music doesn't sound like classical music and classical music doesn't sound like, you know, bluegrass music, but it's all music, you know? And we don't say, you know, that can't, be here because it sounds different like no like that's a kind of music and it might someone might have a rapport with that type and not this other but it's all loud it's it's a big tent <laughs> our infinite nature is a big tent and everybody's invited so i don't uh, i don't have any problem with people praying and i if they feel like they should pray then by god they better pray and that goes for anything i don't care what self-inquiry you're doing if it's a mantra uh, whatever it is, if you feel like that's what you're supposed to be doing and that helps you, by God, do it and, and go all in with it. I mean, I'm not trying to say people have to do Ramana Maharshi stuff or anything like that. Um, everything's allowed for me and, it, you know, it, it has its place. And, and if people are doing bad things, if they're hurting other people, you know, if, if I would never encourage that and go along with that, uh, and, in any way, but I would know that that's actually has its place in a way that maybe we can't see now, but that that person has a journey through some darkness. And I'm, I'm not endorsing it or saying they should do it or anything, but that it too is part of reality and has a place in the movement of what we are in our infinite nature. So don't get me wrong, I don't want to stir anybody up out there, but you know, the, the bad things that we don't like and stuff they aren't they aren't to be endorsed but they too have a place and uh that's that's not always the easiest pill to swallow but it is true yeah something tells me you're not quite done sharing your your experiences that led you up till today so continue well i i it's funny because that this question has come up there was a group i, I might give a talk with um and they said, do you ever get done with this? And I've been thinking about that. I was like, you know, that's really hard to say because on some level, you're done when you realize everything is the self. I mean, that, that's what it is. But on, a, on another level, and maybe a more important level, does a guitarist ever get done playing the guitar and trying to master their craft? Not really. And so this self-exploration, uh, on one sense, it is done because you realize what it is and what you are, but you aren't done exploring it. You know, you, you aren't, your infinite nature never gets done. So I still have different insights all the time and, and things that, you know, show up. And it's, I haven't found an end to self-exploration. And I, I do hear people talk about it, there being this end. And I, I kind of get why they're saying that, but... To me, I, in a way, and Mike used to talk about this too, I feel like I'm just getting started. Like, you know, what can show up and the depth of, of what could show up, you know, awakenings within awakenings within awakenings. You know, the Taoist awakening isn't exactly the same as the Christian mystic awakening and the Christian mystic awakening, not exactly the same as the Ramana Maharshi non-dual awakening. Like, I feel like it's, <laughs> it's endless, this, this, creative display and, and my relationship to it and what I can realize and what I haven't realized. So I don't want to give anyone the impression out there that I'm, I am done and it's all over. And it, it is in one sense when you realize what you are, but it's, 
this exploration of, of your infinite nature, I don't think you get done. And I don't think you want to be. How could you? No, it, do you mind if I ask you, I'm not sure if you can tell me, where you are right now on the, let's say, the cutting edge of your own spiritual awakening, where, yes, you know what the ball game is all about, but there's nuances that fill in along the way to continually make you know even more about the truth of self. Well, it's kind of like this. Um, I am I. And that I that I am exists outside of time and space. It's my true self and it's eternal and it has no beginning or no end. How that I shows up, how it is manifesting as this world, as different insights, as different awakenings, it really has no end. So in any given day, I'm just being myself and watching as things present. And so just the other day, I had an old, uh, some old energy just kind of came out of nowhere and, and arose. And I could feel the energy. I knew it was my true nature, but it was linked to, you know, something that had happened in my childhood. And I was like, oh, look at that. See, there's still even stuff in there. Like it's, you know, it's, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but that I saw that I was like, oh, that, you know, that energy, that, that feeling was tied to that event when I was a little kid. You know, it presented. So I'm in a state of watching. I'm in a state of being. And what shows up is always a mystery. And that's a cool place to be. You know, if you can get to a place where you're not trying to get done anymore, and you can just be yourself and just see what shows up, that's the best game in town. I, I mean, really, in my, my humble opinion, that's the best game in town. And I have this strong sense, there ain't no end to that. This body will go away and then something else is gonna arise in its place and maybe up in the astral realms and maybe in the cosmos, I don't know. Maybe some other world, maybe some other species, I have no idea, but I just have this sense, there's really no end to that. Because why would you wanna to get to the end of that? you're right then what are you gonna do i mean <laughs> come on like this is your infinite nature something about it likes to create it's never actually creating what shows up because it is what shows up but but the play of it the uh, <laughs> the dance like you're not going to get done with that and so i i'm cool with it and i'm happy to just see what shows up and i may have an awakening tomorrow that just blows everything i said in this talk out of the water and like that's all horseshit. I don't believe any of that. I have no idea. But all I can say is if you can get to the place and all you can, who's ever still listening to this, where you can just be your natural self, you're not trying to get done with anything and you can just see what shows up, man, that's a good spot to be. <laughs> it's a good place to be. Whether you realize it's the self or not, you know, whether you realized every single thing is the self or not, it doesn't matter. If you can get to a place where you can just be yourself and just see what shows up and enjoy that, the mystery of it, you're, uh, well, you're in a good spot. That's yeah. all I can say. Yes. I don't want anyone to bite down too hard on, on what I've said. My path is unique to me. Your path will be unique to you. There may be things in common. There may not. So whether you listen to this talk or whoever you listen to, I, I do caution people, just, just know, uh, I don't think our infinite nature needs to do do-overs. You know, it, it's, you're gonna have a unique path, take what feels right, dismiss what doesn't, but um, just don't turn anything I, I say into some, that's the way it's gotta be or a pattern or, or some categorical, you know, way with it. It's, just take it lightly, hold, hold it lightly. It, it's what presented for me. And maybe you'll find some similar things. Maybe you'll find totally different things. So I just want to emphasize that. Yeah, and I think it's completely unnecessary. Anybody who's been with us this far into this interview knows. Ted, nobody's still with us in this interview. <laughs> I guarantee you there are people. I'll send you the, the letters and the comments when they come in. There's this Thursday program. Uh, meets satsang uh, every week in which I met a person who became my friend. His name is Philip Franta. And as it turns out, 
He's been with the group since the very beginning. He's quite aware of all things that we've been talking about here and many more. He and I went to the same high school and never knew one another. I think even in the same grade. He and I grew up on the same street, Saratoga Avenue in Canton, Ohio, and never knew each other. He and I have been on the same path through the, the torrential 60s uh, and the new wave of new age and through all that to the point where we are today and never knew that about ourselves until now. He loved your talk, your discussion that you prompted on the Thursday meeting, at the Thursday meeting, and he sent me some follow-up questions, one of which was, he said, you talked fairly extensively, not only about the subject of joy, but your discovery of it with the experiences that you've had. Do you want to say more? Yes, I do. Um, so there was joy, obviously there was joy and peace with that big awakening at, at age 30, but even after coming out of the dark night of the soul, those really, really difficult years, even when I was being still, and I understood what that really meant, what the, the masters are pointing out with that, I was much, much calmer. Life was much better. But I wasn't really experiencing what you'd call joy. I, I was kind of, and I was aware, I was, you know, where is the, the joy? I mean, it, life's better. I can definitely get through it like this. Uh, I'm not an anxious mess anymore um but i am not feeling this joy um and what i found was when i had that second awakening listening to the rubu gita when you realize that you are the screen of consciousness itself and every single thing is the self there is joy right there there's something that can't really be described. Some people call it beingness, consciousness, bliss. There's a bliss component and it is joyous to just be yourself in a way where you're no longer identifying as a separate somebody or you're identifying with distorted thoughts or your vastness are having their way with you. When you're just being yourself and you can sense that, the joy kind of came online. So this, you say, can work or can help, uh, even when you're aware of your own probably limitless vasanas. I mean, vasanas are tendencies that uh, leave an imprint in your life. Many people believe from this life alone, and even more people believe from previous lives. I'm not sure where I am on that thought. Leave it aside for a second. But that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of crap that clogs the pipes, if you forgive my language. So the learned tendencies tend to need to be plowed through, I would guess, tendencies such as guilt and shame and fear and low self-esteem. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg here? Don't you have to plow through that? Well, you know, that's a really good question, Ted, because I did plow through a lot of it first before that joy kind of came online. But I can't say for sure that it's necessary because, you know, Ramana Maharshi, just one day in one fell swoop, the whole thing went out at age 16. So I can't say that that can't happen for people. I don't think it's common. I think often there is an initial awakening like I had at age 30. And then there's this process of really burning through your stuff. And then you might or may not, depending, then you might have a further awakening. But I do tend to think while a lot of that stuff is there, it's going to present itself, and I wouldn't say that it all has to be blown out, but a, at least a pretty good chunk for the, the joy to kind of present itself seems to feel right to me. Um, that was certainly my living experience. Question. Your first awakening, I'm finding out just today, came prior to your almost a decade of hell. Uh, eight, nine years of suffering, intense suffering. Is that necessary or a requirement for all of us aspirants? Your second, your second awakening came at the conclusion of that. I wouldn't say it's, it's uh, necessary. Um, you mean whether the suffering has to come after the awakening? Is that what you mean? No, if it has to happen at all. I mean, it, it's, I've gone through similar experiences for two or three years now, and I don't want to get personal or anything, but I think a lot of people are in that mix. And a lot of people haven't even started 
that sort of experience. And I'm wondering if it's part of the process. Yeah, I don't want to set it down as a rule for anybody. No, I don't think you have to suffer. Um, I, you know, Sargadatta seemed to, didn't seem to be suffering that much in his personal story of three years, but I, I do want to say, and I need to be real here, I think it's for the vast majority, it's going to be some part of the process. You're probably going to have some difficult energies that present themselves. You're going to have some difficult stuff in you that, that needs to come out. Because again, I really want to emphasize nothing is gained. The self that you are is already there. It's like the sun shining. You know, it's always shining. It just might be there might be clouds in the way. So it, it's exactly like that. Like the clouds, the, the thoughts, the vastness, the tendencies, they have to dissipate. And then you think, oh, well, it's, it's there the whole time. It's what it is. So I think for most people it goes like that, but I don't want anyone to hear this talk and be like, oh, well, I haven't even started yet. So now I know I'm going to have to go through, you know, no, it may be that way for you. It may not. It may last a short time. It may last, it may last longer, but don't turn it into a rule that it has to be like that. Can you tell us maybe some of the greatest pitfalls or mistakes that people make in their own spiritual pursuit? Let's put it that way. It's a good question. Uh, honest, the most truthful answer is nobody's ever making a mistake. Even if you feel like you're making a mistake, it has its place. Okay, that's the truth. But on a more relative level, I will say, and I witnessed and I experienced, there is so much out there these days with the internet, with um, treats and, and teachers galore that you can really get lost if you expose yourself to too much stuff. Yeah. And I see that so often. I can sometimes someone will email me and I and I can just feel it like I'm talking to about four other teachers that they're talking to. That's who I feel like I'm talking to. Because I can just feel that they're there, there's just a lot of other stuff that they're exposing themselves to. And it can get real confusing real fast. And if you're gonna do you're going to have those years probably no matter what, but eventually coming into focus with a teaching lineage that feels right to you is really important. You start to hone in. Uh, and I think you've kind of done that with Romanum's teaching. At some point, you're kind of like, you know, there's a lot out there. None of it's wrong. It's yeah. not even right or better than others, but it's like, you know, if you want to, the metaphor I use for this is if you want to learn to master the guitar, you don't try and learn the drums, the piano, and the saxophone at the same time. You know, you got to get onto the guitar. And then if you want to, like some sages have, after you master the guitar, go a long way with it, then go learn the piano if you want. You know, and, and people have done that. But don't, if you are all over the place with this, it's going to be rough. It's it was for me. I had some years like that. And I was, it was crazy. Yeah. It was too much. Taoist stuff. And then I'm reading, you know, the Christian mystics and, and then, you know, Advaita Vedanta and the Zen guys, and then the, the Zen guys within the Zen guys, it was way, way, way too much. And I, I didn't know it at the time. I thought more is more, but sometimes less is more. And I think in spirituality, that can be really true. I've seen that transition more than most people in that. It was 25 years ago, I started putting the first of our 450 soldier and spiritual interviews, people on a spiritual path, any path, mostly there were Sai Baba paths, but it didn't make a whole lot of difference to me. I loved them all. I started putting them online a quarter of a century ago. And when YouTube came along, I jumped on board right away. They were only allowing you to do nine minute and 59 second videos. Then I got grandfathered in. You had the field all to yourself because I was interested in other points of view, but nobody was sharing them. It's changed like a landslide since then. And with the algorithms of YouTube, they can pick up in a nanosecond if you're interested in Nisargadatta, Sai Baba, uh, baseball scores, uh, porn, uh, you name yeah. it. They'll literally fill your whole schedule with it. And when it comes to spiritual pursuit in Vedanta, Advaita, non-duality, there's dozens of people who can give you conflicting ways of looking at the same point. So, Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> that is for sure. I wanted to touch in particular on the point you've made to me specifically and others in this talk about 
be mindful of getting too involved in groups that love to intellectualize the subject because they can dig down into the weeds endlessly and lose you or bore you or confuse you. And that's happened to me. And that's pretty much why I'm just in a Ramana group right now. Yeah, you know, it's there's a time and a place to try to get an intellectual understanding of things. You know, it, it's not wrong, but what I ultimately found is that's not going to do it for you. You know, you're not going to start experiencing the joy and, and feeling like you're you're clear. So eventually, I kind of feel like I got to leave the the philosophy behind. And talking about it incessantly on that level, it just wasn't helping. And so I do caution people like, sure, learn about the teachings, like figure out as much as you can. But if you're doing the same thing every day, just reading this stuff and just going in circles in your mind, I don't know. I mean, if, if that does it for you, great, but it didn't for me. So I, I don't suggest it as a way forward necessarily. I told Philip Franta that I would ask the list of questions he sent me that sprung out of your talk on the Thursday a few weeks ago. You've already answered quite a few of them. Here's one that he posed that I thought was curious. He said, in your talk, uh, you referenced Nisargadatta's popular phrase, I am that, I am that. But you turned that phrase around saying that you prefer it to be that am I. Elaborate. It's just really, I said that because there are some people, if you still are identifying as a, an individual entity and you're saying it from that perspective, I am that, that's not really true. It's actually the other way around. That is what's being the, the ego entity, the sense of it. That is what everything is being. And so it, I like to say mostly I am that I am, because that's really the best way to say it. Um, but if you just have to be careful because you know this, this false sense of self will come in and flame anything. And, and it can, if it's still online, you know, it'll say I am that, but that isn't exactly it. That's it's the other way around. Uh, this program has taught me a lot about human nature and people's thirst, their absolute quest to learn more about themselves. You, you've talked about people being careful about where they go with their involvement in groups and whatnot. What would you say to a newcomer on this path who felt an inner pull to find out what you found out? I would say two things. Trust your gut feeling more than the thoughts in your head. That's number one. If you have a feeling something feels right, go with that. Very simple, very practical. Uh, more importantly, this is really important. It's the old turtle and hare approach. You know, I was a bad at this, but I wanted it all and I wanted it yesterday. But I'll tell you what, that may have resulted in more suffering than needed to be. Not in the most absolute level. In the most absolute level, it was just ha that's just how it presented. It is what it is. But I suggest one small step at a time. And if you really are committed to that and you trust yourself and your gut instinct, the right books and teachers and things come along and, and you'll, you'll be on your way. But if you try and get, get done and get clear with this and, and you know, like I was, you may be in for a rough ride because I was in for a rough ride. And and so I, I really, just one small step at a time, just deal with what's in front of you. Increasingly, the world seems to be full of people who have had an experience of awakening. Is it that there just seems to be more people proportionately to our population who are awakened today? Or is it actually the case, you think? Do you want the honest answer? Yeah. The self is all. That's it. The self can show up as more and more people awakening, or it can show up as more and more ignorance and destruction, but it is the self. So the, on the most truthful level, it, it seems like more people are awakening, but that is still part of the seeming. You're the one. Mm -hmm. uh, who wouldn't want to share what you've learned? And yet, where do you turn in this busy world to find anybody who has an ounce of interest in what you've learned? It, smacks right up against incredulity and in most number one and worse yet for believers for people of faith as i mentioned earlier blasphemy and heresy how does a person handle that if they want to share well 
I can only tell you what I feel, and that is I am more than happy, pleased as punch, in fact, to leave everyone exactly as they are. <laughs> and I'm not interested in going out and trying to wake anybody up or I take people as they come. I already know for a fact they are the self. And so I don't need to necessarily say, if they ask me a question like you do, I'm more than happy to answer it. But I love people just as they are. I, I do not care in the slightest if I'm talking to someone about at the grocery store about, you know, inflation versus um, self-realization. Like I really, it just, I, it's, that's a burden that you can drop and, you know, people will find you. Ted Henry found me somewhere. Like, so now I'm talking to them. So you don't have to worry about that. And you'll get your opportunities to share will come in their, in their own way. Before I say thank you for joining us today, I want to give you a chance to put it together. And it would be spontaneous because you haven't rehearsed this or prepared it. But what might some final comments from Tyler be uh, about the seriousness of what we're talking about? Well, thank you for having me, Ted. This is fun. I mean, we, we've corresponded for some years and um, I, I didn't know you had such a following on this. Now, I was surprised. I saw it uh, just the other day. I was like, whoa, okay. Uh, but anyway, I appreciate it. And I do enjoy talking about it. I, I would just say to anybody listening that, you know, you're on this path or you wouldn't be listening to this. You're interested and this whole thing is your unique path to get right with what you want to see. And you can go with it any way you want. All you have to do is trust yourself and take it one step at a time. And if you can, try and have a little fun with it. You know, like it, it, just try and relax and be open and see where it takes you. And when the, if, if suffering comes for you like it did for me, have faith. People have been through it you can get through it and that your true nature is unaffected the entire time and it will you will get onto it someday i promise someday in some life you will and the reason why i know that is is because it's literally what you are and it when it wants to present itself it will <laughs> and it's that simple so all is truly well you will get through the suffering and there's a lot of good folks out there and uh you know maybe we'll even cross paths someday so I just want to, I want to only say that uh, I was a good Catholic kid. Jesus taught me a lot. Sai Baba has taught me an enormous amount, 25 years. And Ramana has taught me, and you've taught me too. I hope we all find teachers, those who are interested in pursuing what you've talked about here today, Tyler. And thank you again for being so willing and so open to call it as it is the way you did. Thank you. God bless. Thanks, oh, listen, this was fun, Ted. Um, if, you know, I don't know who responds to this stuff, but if anybody does, you can give them my email. Um, just make sure they're sincere. That's my only requirement. I'm happy to talk to anyone if they're sincerely well, interested. Have a great weekend. Uh, have a great date tonight with your wife. Yeah, tell Jody I said hi. I sure will. Talk to you later. Okay, bye.